Good evening, sir. It's a privilege to be here in front of you all and not be this privilege. And I'm so proud that we are functioning together for so long a time. And we are really enjoying the insurance company and learning every day, rather than we went this day with a legend like Dr. Rajiv Parekh and others coming to us. Today we are going to discuss and talk about the vascular disease or vasculopathies. They are very, in the perspective of increasing life expectancy and metabolic disorders, which are also increasing like diabetes, mellitus, essential hypertension, dyslipidemia, they are really precursor of the peripheral vascular disease or vascular disease. So we have really become a very important topic to learn from Dr. Parag. How do we go about and this? <coughs> Particularly role of the primary care physician like us, who should know when to intervene and when to refer and when to evaluate the patient, those who are coming to us in the day practice, like to refer to the right person at the right time, so that we prevent long-term complication of macro, micro vascular, which is known to us like coronary artery disease, carotid artery disease, strokes and all. So and peripheral vascular disease, which used to be an alcoholic disease, we should have the Burgess disease. I was a myself in Jaipur. It was not very uncommon those days. Those who are smokers, they used to come with a claudication pain and then we used to treat them. Anyway, we have a, a legend with us, Dr. Ali Sari, who is going to give us a talk. Sir is a graduate from uh, MBBS and MS from Valhalla College in 1981 and 1986, FRCS 1987, Chairman Vestler Disease at Sri Gangaram Hospital till 2010. He moved and established a, a vestibular center, the endovascular center at Medanta City and at present he is Chairman of Vestibular Disease, uh, Peripheral Vestibular Disease and Endovascular uh, Sorry. The, he started DMV program at Gangaram Hospital, which is continuing right now. Under his banner, a lot of people have become good doctors, I would say, at the end. So we are so proud to be here with you, sir. And I request Dr. Parekh to give us a talk on the day today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, friends, my seniors, my colleagues, and uh, I don't think very many juniors, I think we're all colleagues. And uh, I think it's very humbling to be here and uh, to be able to interact and talk to uh, legends in their own field, people I've just been introduced to who've been there for 30, 40 years practicing medicine, which is something which is very, very, uh, uh, you know, it's it's indeed a very humbling experience to sort of be introduced to uh, such people who've been working here in this uh, medical field. Now, talking about vascular health, we are all talking about vascular health. Now, first thing, let me just tell you one very simple thing. You know, when I started, I came back from England and I started off my uh, appointment in Gangara Hospital. I was interviewed by the chairman then, uh, at that point of time, was Dr. K.P. Jain, very towering physician of his time. And uh, I was asked, you're a cardiac surgeon? I said, no. Are you a thoracic surgeon? I said, no. He said, then what are you? So I said, sir, I'm a vascular surgeon. So he says, what does that mean? There is no such thing. It is always CTVS. You'll be surprised, I'm sure, and probably you all know. Even today, even today, there is no department of vascular surgery at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, even today. It's all CTVS. It is all being managed by busy cardiac surgeons who don't have the time of the day after having done coronary bypasses and valve replacements. And what I'm going to take you through, I'm going to try and give you a very sort of bird's eye view of all that comprises of vascular diseases. Just something like a presentation, just something that you will be, I'm sure we all see these in our daily practices as physicians, as surgeons, as orthopedic surgeons, as uh, gynecologists. We see this in our daily practices. So what we, have, what we see and what we do Thank you. At the end of the talk, I will ask you a question and that will be, do you think that any cardiac surgeon or cardiologist for that matter 
will be able to do justice to all this in his busy schedule because you see when they are treating coronary artery disease is rampant not to say that vascular disease isn't because vascular disease is actually a component of I mean coronary artery disease is a component of vascular disease the whole thing is just one so that is one thing that I wanted to talk about the second thing is that we are all as old as our blood vessels we are as old as our blood vessels so basically our longevity is directly proportional to the health of our blood vessels so if our vessels blood vessels are diseased now blood vessels of course as you know they run from top to toe if they are diseased then the longevity is definitely going to suffer it's not going to be something which we can overlook so we have to be extremely uh, you know sort of uh, careful about what we uh, what we see what we diagnose and how we treat so that we can try and prolong our lifespan and the lifespan of our patients. Mm -hmm. So this is about ourselves as well. It's not just about patients, it's about ourselves. We are also uh, human beings. So we also have the same diseases and we would be uh, you know, exposed to the same risks. So I'm going to talk about vascular health and I'm going to at the end of the talk also leave you with a little marker. I mean something that we can actually <coughs> check ourselves for ourselves and of course our patients we can check for ourselves which can give us some indication as to the vascular health of our own blood vessels. So that's what we're going to try and do and I'm going to try and brush this. I hope you don't get bored in the end. But anyway, so we start off with this. So you know you will agree that the terminal pathological event before death is thrombosis. Whatever be the cause of death, whatever be the mode of death, not cause, mode of death, the last thing that happens is a cerebral or a coronary thrombosis. The arteries get blocked, there is a thrombus formation and that's the end of life. So thrombosis is extremely, extremely important and it's the last event that occurs. And where does it occur or where does it have the chances of developing? Anywhere in the body. I don't know if you remember, you know, we used to, in our pathology, when we studied our pathology in our MBBS days, there was this, uh, I, I can never forget it, we used to have this uh, uh, textbook of pathology by Harold, um, uh, Robin, Robin, Robin's pathology. That's right. That's right. And I still remember that one photograph in which it says that the first atherosclerotic plaque develops at the age of 25 years of age. So just because you are young, it doesn't mean that you are not going to have atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis starts at 25. And actually, I think you know, if you go back, I'm going to go a little. Uh, into our religious beliefs also you know the lifespan in the olden Vedic times was divided into 100 years first 25 years was supposed to be Brahmacharya Ashram okay 25 to 50 was Grahastha Ashram in which you got married and looked after and have your children and this that then 50 to 75 was one Prastha Ashram in which you looked after and settled everything your family your children your grandchildren whatever you had to do in your family whatever and 75 onwards was Sanyasa Ashram and that carried on till whenever those were the years how were they decided who decided this that 25 years may yoga, 25 years may one prastha shuru hoega or whatever how did it how did it start this if you see the our ancient Vedic um, uh, you know rishis they must have known about atherosclerosis this is exactly what happens at 25 your first plot develops so you are a child you are enjoying brahmacharya ashram till age of 25 the first first plaque appears it is the signal for you to start your family because you know you're moving on so 25 to 50 that queries on during this time then at 50 the progression and the speed increases because don't forget at 100 you got to go nobody is going to live forever so this carries on and the speed and the duration and the progression depends on a our lifestyle which unfortunately is not the best but lifestyle and of course family history hereditary and all the other factors so all that contributes to the development and progression of atherosclerosis in our body and at 100 when you are supposed to go what happens the last event thrombosis of the coronary arteries and that's where you go 
So that's the way the Vedic Rishis, whoever wrote the Vedas, they must have discovered this, I mean, and knew about this, which is the reason why they divided, they didn't divide it into 250 years, they divided it into 200 years. And on the basis of this, and Harold, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Robin. uh, Robbins. <laughs> Robbins, I know I'm remembering Harold with uh, Robbins. So, uh, so Robbins' textbook, they said the same thing that at 25 you start developing prognosis. So this is exactly, so the hallmark pathological lesion of aging is atherosclerosis and it starts very early at the age of 25 and it just progresses depending on the disease. So as it progresses, it of course as I said, arteries are everywhere, blood vessels are everywhere from top to toe and this would involve every, every blood vessel in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the body, every territory. So, coronaries, cerebrovascular, renovascular, I'm not going to talk about these, you all know about it, you know probably much more than me. Coronary artery disease, cardiologists would keep talking about it, cerebrovascular, the neurologist would talk about it, renovascular, the nephrologist would talk about it. I'm going to concentrate only on peripheral vascular disease and you know why, I'll tell you. While we go on, I'll tell you why and why is the peripheral vascular disease extremely important. Peripheral vascular disease, three main uh, sort of, uh, you know, compartment you can say is patients who develop diabetes that increases the rate of atherosclerosis, it increases the, uh, you know, the, the progression and sort of extent. Every possible artery, as uh, as was, was, was said, every possible artery in the body gets affected with atherosclerosis, especially in diabetes. So, diabetic peripheral vascular disease and <coughs> Here is the most important thing, 50% of patients, if they undergo a diabetic foot amputation, they will be dead in 5 years. So any diabetic patient who undergoes a diabetic foot infection amputation will be dead in 5 years. You can imagine the, the gravity of the situation. I mean you are 60 years old, you get a diabetic foot amputation, chances are that 50% of the, uh, I mean chances are that 50% of those people will be dead in 5 years. No other disease causes this kind of mortality, not even coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is going to affect only one territory, that's the heart. The rest of the body is fine. There is nothing else wrong with it if there is only signal. But peripheral artery disease means that every artery in the body, coronary, cerebral, renal and peripheral are all involved. Which is the reason why I am saying that we unfortunately in my speciality, we have a very high mortality rate. Patients come into the hospital and unfortunately die on us because they are just severe, very very severe peripheral artery disease and you know there is something, uh, there, is, there is something that you can't do, there are lots of things that you can't do. So diabetic peripheral vascular disease is probably one of the worst uh, uh, atherosclerotic sort of territories to be involved and of course another important uh, sort of um, I would say a statement and that is aneurysmal disease. 10% of people undergoing a coronary artery intervention, whether it's a bypass or a stent, 10 years after the bypass or, 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 or stent, there is a 10% chance of developing and creating aneurysm. Can you imagine? There are at least a thousand cases being done every day in the city of Delhi. Coronary stents, coronary bypasses, at least a thousand of them. 1000 a day, 365 days a year, okay, 350 days a year. Can you imagine the volume of patients? And 10% of those patients have a chance or a propensity to develop an aortic aneurysm. So it's extremely important that patients who have undergone coronary interventions, be it uh, angioplasty or surgery, they need to be followed up also for abdominal aortic aneurysm because that is an extremely important occurrence. 10% is a huge number. For every 100 patients who have a coronary bypass, if they're going to, 10 of them are going to develop aneurysm, it's a huge number. So, aneurysmal disease again, a very, very important subset of people that you have to. And then comes carotid disease. 25% of patients with left main coronary artery disease, the chances are that they will have significant carotid artery disease. So, 25% left main disease will have significant coronary uh, carotid artery disease, which can lead to, as you know, strokes. And strokes, as you know, 
I mean, if it's a minor stroke, if it's a TIA, that's fine. I mean, you know, you treat it and do whatever. But if it is a tense hemiplegia, you know what life can be like. It's, I mean, you know, I'm sure the person who's going through it would rather want to be dead than to live as a hemiplegic cripple. So that is the severity of peripheral vascular disease which affects our body. So this is the reason why I'm saying that peripheral vascular disease, you have to be extremely, extremely careful and be observant about developing this, especially if somebody's a diabetic, if they are smokers, if they are hypertensive, if they have high cholesterol levels, any of these people who have high risk for diarrhea, for, for, for atherosclerosis, they need to be absolutely careful about following these patients up because otherwise they will run into problems. So, if there is a double or a triple territory involvement, that means along with diabetes, renal disease, as you know, it's prolonged, I mean, you know, long standing diabetic disease leads to nephropathy then eventually patients land up with dialysis or kidney transplant, whatever. And some of these patients, some of these patients will go on to also develop peripheral arterial disease. So this combination, diabetic, renal disease, as well as peripheral arterial disease is one of the worst. Because that means every artery in the body is involved and these patients are going to have a very, very high incidence of gangrene, amputation and thereby reduction in their lifespan. So their longevity is going to suffer if they have diabetic renal disease. And that can go on to less than, I mean almost about 75%, 75% of patients with diabetic renal disease, established diabetic renal disease, who also have peripheral arterial disease, 75% of them will not see five years. So this is the severity of the disease, which is the reason why it's extremely important that we all look at this and follow up these patients. So now certain facts about diabetic foot infections, I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, but we all know that there is yeah, one in every six people with diabetes will have a foot infection during their lifetime. One in six. I mean, it's a huge number. One in six is a huge number. And as you know, di in uh, diabetes, India is supposed to be the diabetic capital of the world. Mm -hmm. Every sixth individual, every tenth individual is supposed to be diabetic or pre-diabetic for that matter. So, there is a huge, and out of those six people are going to have foot infections in their lifespan. And every 30 seconds, so in the next half an hour, 40 minutes while we are talking, at least 30 legs or feet or toes would have been amputated somewhere in the world. Can you imagine the rate of amputation that goes on around? And this is the reason why it's extremely important to follow up these patients with diabetes, make sure that diabetes is well controlled and diabetic euglycemia is maintained and of course these patients followed up and Whatever needs to be done before amputation can, uh, I, 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 you know, is, is, is required. So, one of the most important things when diabetes strikes and forms a diabetic foot infection, when there is a um, ulcer which is not healing, which is refusing to heal, what is the sign? Normally, if anybody gets injured, the wound heals up 10 days, 15 days, 20 days or at least starts to show signs of healing. But if after 15 days of having sustained an infection or a wound infection in the foot anywhere, if it is showing no signs of healing, that's the time to wake up. Unfortunately, as you all know, as was alluded to before, that diabetes also affects the nerves. Because of the neuropathy, which is in a lot of cases sensory neuropathy, which means that these patients develop insensate feet. They have no symptoms. So the most protective reflex in our body, you know which is the most protective reflex in our body? Reflex. Pain. Pain. That's the best sensation God could have given us. Because that is what will allow us to stay back. If suppose this surface is hot, if I touch it, I am going to pull my hand back. But if I don't have any pain sensation, I will keep holding it. This will burn. I develop a blister. So, pain sensations, because they are lost, diabetic foot infections, most cases, if they have insensate foot, they will have no pain. Why are you saying all this? Because it is not hurting me. Which is, which is the worst thing, that's the most scary thing. 
If somebody tells you, I have a wound which is not healing for the last one month or two months and I have no pain, so I don't, I'm not bothered with just getting a dressing done. Now that is the time that you have to really wake up and tell this fellow that, look here, this is really getting worse and you should not get onto this because if this progresses, it will land up or you will land up with an amputation. So, if the blood supply of that area is defective, is impaired, is occluded, is blocked, because as we know that in diabetes there is a higher propensity, a higher incidence of, of atherosclerotic occlusion, arteries get completely blocked and if that happens then these patients will develop ulcers which will not heal. And we need to always check whenever there is an ulcer which is not healing, check the vascularity, make sure that you know that the pulses, uh, I mean the, 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 the blood supply in that area is is, 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 is present. You know which is the most important and the most crucial investigation to check the presence of blood supply in the feet? Pulse. Absolutely right. Bang on. This is exactly what we were taught. You know. Straight away Doppler Karalo, the CT scan Karalo, angiography Karalo. I mean you know of course you can get those done. You may need to get those done. But the first thing the patient is in front of you, feel the pulse. In fact, what I would suggest is if a patient gets he's diabetic and all of us as physicians, we always feel the radial pulse. Forget the radial pulse. Feel is dorsalis pedis. You won't forget it. Feel is dorsalis pedis. Feel is posterior. If you cannot feel that pulse and the patient has an ulcer, then you know that there is a vascularity issue and that needs to be fixed and that needs to be seen. So it's extremely important that vascularity has to be fixed. There are of course very fancy gadgets which we have in Vedanta at, at a hospital because we are a specialized vascular center. We have uh, automated machines. We have the machine that you see in the, on the left hand side. This one, this is an ankle brachial index machine. So we have four blood pressure cuffs which are applied at the same time in both all the four limbs and it automatically measures the systolic pressure in the arms and the legs. If the systolic pressure in the arms is more than that in the legs, that means the leg pressure is less arterial pressure, that means there is a blockage. Normally they should all be the same, about 10 millimeters here or there, but by and large they should be the same. But if there is a, like a 40 or a 50 millimeter drop in the legs, obviously there is a blockage. So that's the first test that we do. This is something that is done on a routine basis, but as I said, pulses give you a lot of information. Then of course we have this, if there is a wound then we have what is called an ischemia monitor. This picks up the transcutaneous partial pressure of oxygen. So you put this probe on the skin wherever a wound is and this will tell you that the pressure here of oxygen in the tissues is at whatever level. If it's less than 35 millimeters of mercury, that wound will not heal. So you have to do something, check it out and then make sure that that is, uh, you know, something has to be done for that. So that is it. Then of course you have a color doctor as you know. Yes, if you can't feel the pulse then you need to investigate and the best investigation, in fact the gold standard today is an arterial color doctor done by a responsible, intelligent ultrasonologist. You know, it cannot be just a cursory examination, aren't you? Everything is fine, no. It has to be done by somebody who understands arterial disease and arterial anatomy. It's extremely important for them to pick up which artery is blocked, what is the degree of blockage, what is the extent of blockage, because that is the information that anybody will be wanting to look at. So that's the this thing, and here you can see, this is a frozen image as you can see. This is the plaque, this is the atherosclerotic plaque that you can see, and you can see that there is a reduction in the lumen. The artery is that big, there is a plaque here also, so the artery should have been from here to here. The blockage, so, oops, sorry. So here, this is the, the this is the uh, balloon, that's the blockage, and we pass a balloon just as you would do for the coronary arteries, and you blow the balloon, and the plaque gets shifted to the side, then you can put in a stent, and this artery would be open. But the story in diabetes is completely different. This, what you saw, was a stenosis, that means there is a block, which, I mean, the artery is narrow, but not blocked. In diabetes, there is a thromboangitis obliterans, that means the entire human gets completely occluded. Now, if it's completely occluded, how are you going to go through it? You can't. It's, it's calcified. There is no way you can pierce that. So, what do we do? Well, yes, bypass is what we used to do. I mean, what we still do, but less of that. You know, about, I would say, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, an Indian radiologist working in England, in Leicester, Aman Bolia is his name, he's a good friend of ours. Yeah. 
And on a Friday evening, a patient was sent to him by one of his, uh, you know, British vascular surgeons that look here, I've got to go to the pub for a drink. This fellow has come and his artery is blocked. I mean, I can't feel his pulse. See if you can open it up. So how am I going to open it up? He says, okay, fine, let me try. So he started doing this and he found the artery completely blocked. Now, while the artery is completely blocked, so he was just about to take his gloves off and said, he says, I'm sorry, you'll have to bypass this. There's nothing else you could do. Artery shot. The nurse accidentally pushed the wire. Instead of taking it out, she pushed it in. <laughs> she pushed it in and the wire went through and it went across. And she, the, she sort of told Amal, she said, sir, I think the wire has gone somewhere. I hope I have not perforated the artery. So he said, my God, what the hell have you done? Anyway, so he takes a shoot. And this is what had happened. The wire went along the side of the artery, all along inside the artery, not outside, but it went all along inside the artery and reached the other side, which is the open side. So he says, the wire has reached. Why don't I blow this up? I won't blow. So he took a balloon and he plastered this atheroma onto one side of the artery. He kept blowing the balloon and brought it onto one side. And the artery opened up. This is what is called a sub-intimal angioplasty, which means that you push the atheroma onto one side, you marginalize or lateralize the atheroma onto one side, and the artery opens up and it's kept open with the flow of blood. You don't even need a stent. So this was what was discovered on a Friday evening in Leicester by Aman Bolia and it is gone by his name, it says Bolia Angioplasty, that is what it is known as worldwide all over. And this is something and now there, I called him over, I was in Gangaram at that time and he called over and he showed us how to do it and then after that he also started and we are doing this on a regular basis. So this is something that you can do, you don't even need a stent, the patient comes in, you push this wire through, of course. It's not easy. You know, you can actually, if you use too much force, you can actually rupture the artery also. There is a technique involved. It's not something that, you know, you want to just do for the sake of doing it. But yes, it is something that can be done and it does not need a stent. Which is great because you don't want to leave anything behind because these are calcified arteries. They will get blocked again. The idea of doing this angioplasty is not to keep the artery open for forever. If this is just to heal the wound, that's what you need to do. You've got a wound. It's not healing, you need to increase the blood supply, you push this wire through, do a balloon angioplasty, the blood reaches there, the wound heals. After that, if the artery closes, it doesn't matter because enough good actors would have opened up. You can't keep these arteries open, it's atherosclerotic uh, calcified uh, diabetic disease, they're going to get blocked. So this is exactly, and this is, I'll show you an example. Here was this patient who just refused to heal this wound. He had lost one toe, wound just not healing. This is the popliteal artery. There's a complete occlusion of this artery here, as you can see. This is his anterior tibial, which is hanging. This is only working through some collateral, but obviously it's not enough. So here we do a balloon angioplasty. I mean, the subintimal angioplasty. We connected this top artery here is connected to this artery here, and then we connected this anterior tibial also. So now you have three good arteries going under the foot, and surprise, the wound is healed up. So this is what subintimal angioplasty can do and this is something that one does and we can get on and treat a lot of these diabetic foot patients to try and avoid amputation because as I said, the trick is to avoid amputation because if you, if the patient lands up with amputations then it is going to be a problem because 50% of those patients are going to be in trouble. So this is just one small aspect of what we do, which is diabetic foot disease. But there are lots of other things that we can do. I'm going to now just run you through a series of photographs which you will be able to see. So we've been using modern technology with a lot of sort of, uh, you know, endovascular techniques, minimal surgery, minimal access surgery without, I, I mean, you know, without too much of operative uh, uh, intervention. Sometimes actually combining both of them, we do also hybrid cases, that means in case we cannot open up an artery, we make one small, instead of making a big long incision, we make one small incision in the groin and we can do a hybrid which means an open plus an endo, uh, combine both of them and get a completely open artery, so those are also possible. So here what we do is 
this is something that we see a lot of times. You see gangrene of the feet, then you see gangrene of the fingers as well. If you get the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, radial or the brachial arteries getting occluded. And this is an aneurysm of the popliteal artery. You can have somebody who had a traumatic injury, somebody who got was hit by a ball at the back of his knee and developed an artery. That's a pseudo and that's an aneurysm as you can see here. That's the popliteal artery, that's the aneurysm. So this was uh, operated upon because you know this is right behind the knee and you can't really do uh, any endovascular treatment here. So we did this and this is a carotid artery. Patients develop carotid blocks and they develop strokes. So most of the times when not most of the time, but whenever there is a 80% or more, 70% or more stenosis of the carotid artery, the best thing to do is to remove the plug. Of course, interventionists would say, and so do I, I also, we also do this, we can always put in a stent in the carotid artery, just as you put it in the coronaries or in the legs, you can always put a carotid stent. Yes, of course, we can do it. We also do that, you know, in, in our department, we do this as well. But a carotid territory is a different animal altogether. We've got a very sensitive organ at the top. You cannot, you cannot and should not hope that even a small microthrombus going beyond the artery up into the brain because you don't know what it can cause. One small little clot can actually block off your entire um, uh, frontoparietal <laughs> temporal region and you'll be paralyzed for life. So nothing should actually go up. So if there is a possibility of opening up this artery and removing the plant, that is the best and the best long-term solution. Instead of putting in a stent, because when you put in a stent, the plaque still remains. All you've done is you pushed it to the sides. And a stent, as you, if you've seen it, a stent is actually a net. Okay, it's like a metal mesh. So small little plaques, small little microthrombi can actually enter from the plaque and still go up into the brain, which is why the the incidence of strokes after putting in a stent is much more than when you operate and take it out. Because what you've done is you've taken it out, and that's the you opened up this artery. This is the blockage here as you can see that's the common carotid artery external and internal carotid and here we've opened up this artery this tube that you can see I don't know if you can appreciate it this is the shunt that we put in while we are operating so that the blood continues to flow so there's no uh, detrimental uh, effect on the brain and here we have removed this plaque and this is the plaque can you imagine this plaque is sitting there if you put a stent through this this stuff is still sitting there it's not gone out anywhere so this can actually embolize and this once it's done you can see a beautiful angiogram you can see a clean artery and this artery is as good as new because there's no plaque there and this is not going to re-stenose or not going to have because as you know that stents get blocked i mean coronary stents get blocked they eventually need either re and or re uh, intervention or maybe a bypass so this happens to the carotid arteries also but a, a carotid endarterectomy is from and we do it under local anesthesia this is done under local anesthesia. The patient is awake. You can just make a cut here, remove it. The patient is awake. You keep talking to him. This is the best form of monitoring. While we are operating, if the patient is talking to you, that means all is going on well with his brain. Otherwise, you know, things could go wrong. So we operate under local anesthesia, remove the plaque, and the patient goes home in two days. So it's it's a, it's an excellent operation. But if there is significant or serious coronary artery disease and or the patient cannot even lie down, then of course you have to put in stents. So we do put in stents. I also put in stents myself, carotid stents, but in selected patients who cannot be operated upon because that gives them a better outcome. So this is what it is and this is of course, we talked about aortic aneurysms developing after the, the uh, coronary interventions. That is an aneurysm and this is an as you can see, this is the infra, these are the two renal arteries, this is the infrarenal aortic aneurysm. And today, previously we used to have one big long incision, we used to open up this and put in plastic tubes inside. That was the open aortic aneurysm repair. Today we don't have to do that. We don't even make a cut. Through a puncture hole in the groins, we put in a stent graft. This is a stent graft which has been introduced from inside in this and you can see the post-operative film, this is a stent graft covered with, uh, you know, it's a covered stent. It is introduced into both the iliac arteries and to this and the blood is now flowing through this down. The aneurysm is obliterated. This can be done under local anesthesia from the groins and it gets 
it gets completely uh, resolved. This is of course a patient with a uh, with an AV fistula and a lot of patients unfortunately are undergoing dialysis today because everybody cannot find a kidney donor. Bankar? Yeah, we'll have some questions. Okay, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Team. You may finish. You may finish. Okay. So, okay. So this is an aortic, um, uh, I mean, uh, AV fistula, and, and this can be, of course, angioplasty, and we can open this again without an aortic, uh, I mean, without an open surgery. This is a traumatic thoracic aneurysm. Somebody with a seat belt, you know, in the car was hit and developed a traumatic rupture of the thoracic artery and you can see thoracic aortic uh, rupture and this again is and can be treated with a, a stent graft as we talked about. This is how an aneurysm develops. You can see this, this is a normal artery and because of repeated uh, I mean, uh, episodes of hypertension uncontrolled, the elastic fragmentation occurs, the artery starts to dilate and it keeps degrading the intima and the wall till it eventually ruptures because when it ruptures then obviously it gives you only three minutes to 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 to, to, live, to live. So this has to be picked up before the aneurysm uh, develops. So aneurysms, of course, are very uh, I mean uh, are rare under the age of 50. But as I said, 10 years post coronary intervention, 10% risk of aneurysm. This is of course an aneurysm, as you can see. This is a CT scan, and you can see that this is an aortic aneurysm on this side. Now, coming to a, another very small tip, sir. Two minutes. So this is something that may interest a few people. This is varicose veins. We again a very very common uh, practice, clinical practice. You see a lot of people with varicose veins. People are standing for long periods of time. People are sitting for long periods of time. People are traveling longer. People are taking long distance flights. If there is a family predisposition or a hereditary factor, the veins start getting dilated, especially after pregnancy. A lot of women develop a lot of varicose veins after pregnancy, and these veins become bigger and bigger. And you can see sometimes really horrible looking these things. Previously, we used to operate upon these. We used to do, you know, we used to make cuts. We used to remove these veins and pull them out. You can see the number of veins that have been removed today. We do none of that. Today, what we can do is we can pass a laser fiber or a radio frequency fiber without surgery a small puncture hole in the uh, in the leg and we put in this catheter and we can actually shrink this vein in front of our eyes and you can see this this is we can even inject a, you know under ultrasound guidance we can inject some glue and with the pressure of the ultrasound we can actually cause these veins to, to stick together and these veins close off completely the patient comes under local anesthesia he comes in and walks out in one hour in one hour, he is walking back home. There is no operation. There is no surgery. And this can be done. As you can see, this is how it is. That is before and this is after. And that's the procedure we put in this catheter. And it's all done as soon as possible. So now, coming to again some another very important thing. And that has assumed a lot of importance today because of COVID. COVID-19, unfortunately, as you all know, was not just a pneumonia. It was a thromboinflammation. There was a lot of thrombosis which was going on in the body. We are seeing, even today, it's almost a year now since hopefully we are, uh, you know, COVID is behind us. But the number of patients who are still coming back to you with thrombosis or thrombotic disorders, either in the lungs or in the heart, is still, I mean, a significant number. And this is because of the, uh, the thromboinflammation which occurs in, in uh, I mean in COVID-19, as you can say, there is a hundred times greater risk of thrombosis in patients who were hospitalized. So patients who had COVID and who were hospitalized for whatever reasons, of course, though, that at that time, there is a hundred times higher risk of developing the uh, uh, venous thromboembolism but an even more important thing once they've developed the venous thromboembolism and you've treated it there is a 20 percent chance of a recurrence within five years of the initial treatment so don't think that you've treated it once and the patient is fine is never going to have it again there is a 20 percent chance that this can come back within five years that means there must be something which is there in the body which is predisposing these patients to develop uh, you know the the, the the thrombosis and of course the treatment as you know for this is anticoagulation venous you know dvt the pain thrombosis any this thing is anticoagulation and it started off with you know the the regular heparin that we used to inject intravenously then there are the oral um, anticoagulants the warfarin and now the oral direct inhibitors but of course the low molecular weight heparin is 
is the standard therapy in hospitals when the patients come into hospital with acute uh, issues they are given low molecular weight heparin and of course fonda parinux which is an indirect factor 10a inhibitor because this is to be given once a day all the other low molecular weight heparins all have to be given twice a day so there is a patient compliance issue and fonda parinux is probably the best in 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 in, in these situations and of course it is fonda parinux is indicated in the treatment of dvt and peak and, and pulmonary embolism and the prevention of patients undergoing orthopedic surgery abdominal surgery and any patient admitted in a medical icu for a coronary condition for a heart i mean for a lung condition or any condition neuro icu all these patients must be thromboprophylaxed with fonda parinux or uh, enoxaparin for that matter for while they are in 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 the hospital because there is a very very high risk of developing venous thromboembolism and deep vein thrombosis while a patient is admitted in the hospital in fact is the commonest cause of in hospital death pulmonary embolism is the commonest cause of in hospital death so of course this is uh, 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 you know you can actually send these patients home because it's only one injection once a day it's like injecting yourself with insulin it's a prefilled syringe as you all know it can be injected once a day and this is equally efficacious and 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 this can be done so the medical management of deep vein thrombosis you know you can start off with aspirin clopidogrel is something that can be given and low molecular weight of fonda parinux is probably the drug of choice but you can then follow these up patients with aspirin and low dose uh, newer oral anticoagulants the new ones which are available and if you must obviously look after their <coughs> Uh, you know the lipid profile. You can start off with statins, but people who cannot tolerate statins, there is a big number which is growing. People who cannot tolerate statin for variety of reasons, liver for problems, or just body aches and pains. You know, some people come and say, "Doctor, I'm not feeling well. I just don't want to take any statins." So there is this injection which is available, which is Repatha, which is a monoclonal antibody, which is available. It's a little expensive, but it is something which you can do twice a month, one injection every 15 days, and this takes care of your. Uh, LDL levels and your and 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 your uh, triglycerides and cholesterol. So this is something which is there. And of course we have the antioxidants, the CoQ10, the omega 3s, and the L-levocarnitine. So these are of course the uh, mainstays. Now coming to what I was trying to tell you here, vascular health. How do we assess our vascular health when we go back and we want to see how can we assess our own vascular health? What do we do? So there is something. It should obviously be the test should be something which is non-invasive. You don't want to keep getting injections or CT scans or X-rays and stuff like that. So something which is easily done, easily repeatable, and anybody can do it. So what we do here is we use the ultrasound doctor. So you know there are three bifurcations in our body which are accessible very easily to the ultrasound. The carotid bifurcation is under the skin. The aortic bifurcation, you can do it from the side. You can see the aortic bifurcation at the at the lower end, and the femoral bifurcation, which you can see, uh, I mean, which can be very well easily picked up by the by the doctor or herself. So these three bifurcations can be picked up very easily, and if you assess and you find that there is a 50% or more stenosis here in the carotid, 50% or more blockage in the uh, uh, femoral arteries or a 50% or more dilatation of the aorta you remember we are talking about aneurysm we are talking about patients who are being followed up for uh, post coronary intervention so if you see that there is a dilatation of the aorta or a narrowing of the aorta a narrowing of the femoral artery narrowing of the carotid artery that is something that should wake you you know wake you up and say look here atherosclerosis is progressing at a fairly rapid rate so what is it going to what is what is it that we should modify so that the rate of progression can be reduced? So here we look at all our all our risk factors: diabetes, smoker, hypertension, dyslipidemia. So we worked out a score, which is called the vascular health score. So if there is a 50% or more uh, uh, disease at the bifurcation, whether it is stenosis or aneurysm or stenosis in the groin, along with one along with one risk factor, one of these four, there is a 25% reduction in your longevity. So if there is one risk factor and there is a 50% or more reduction, um, uh, I mean disease, then this actually is something that you should be worried about because this is what is going to progress at a fairly rapid rate. So again, lifestyle modification, control diabetes, control blood pressure, stop smoking, um, anti-lipid uh, therapy and exercise and you know, uh, all the other uh, sort of, you know, do well, 
goodwill things, Ram, Ram Dev Baba, and uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, so, so whatever I mean, whatever one's belief is, I'm just saying. I said there are a lot of people. Believe. So, so whatever one's belief is, but the important yeah. thing is that you change your lifestyle, improve your lifestyle, and most importantly, keep repeating this follow-up every six months to one year. If you keep checking this out, if you see that there is a rate of progression, then get it treated rather than just let this bypass. Because if this happens, this is going to seriously progress and give rise to a lot of other complications. So, for healthy blood vessels, you all know, as I said, stop smoking, control diabetes, blood pressure, reduce cholesterol and regular exercise. And this is essentially what you have to do for a healthy lifestyle. Sir, I'm sorry, I have a lot of time for you. Please come there. I love pleasure. Thank you, sir. Dr. Tulsi has a wonderful talk. I think you have to listen. Can you just put the light on, please? Yeah. I think uh, it was uh, all of you would agree it was a wonderful session by Dr. Rajiv Pandey, sir. Uh, I think it was a master class on, on vascular health. I am sure as we have decided uh, before we come to uh, the uh, general club as described by Dr. Amal Kalra sir, there will be some questions and we will take those questions. Dr. Elam Parasha has the first question. Thank you, Sushil. Uh, Parekh, wonderful talk. Uh, you are one of the few original inhabitants of Delhi. I remember from the last talk, so good, good to meet a good Delhi. <laughs> Now, uh, question is that I deal in ENT and there is a lot of vertigo patients and uh, sometimes it, it is felt that it is carotid artery which are causing the problem. So, which is the best investigation you would offer in such a case, MR angiography or, or carotid doppler or what? Yeah, I think carotid doppler is probably the easiest, safest, easily repeatable thing and it is, if it is done accurate, it is accurate. It is accurate if it is done by the right person. You know, it has to be somebody who knows what he is looking for, what he is looking for and what is the extent of disease. So, he should know the anatomy and he should be able to tell. So, you have to find your own ultrasonologist. There are some very, very good people uh, in town. Most of the people can do a good job. But a carotid doctor is probably the gold standard for peripheral arteries which can be imaged peripherally. You know, I mean, instead of expensive investigations like you know CTMRI, of course you can get those done. So if the Doppler tells you that there is a 50, 60, 70 percent prognosis, then you have to get a CTM. But uh, you, I don't think you can really advise somebody uh, to get a CTM to have done just because you feel that there is a. So uh, we have a person sir who deals uh, with lot of blood vessels every day. Doctor S. Padar sir has a question. So very uh, related to that. <coughs> If you don't feel dorsal spinitis, then is it advisable to do CT angio directly? There are two reasons for it. One, uh, Doppler you said it is uh, operator dependent. Second, on Doppler you don't find the detailed anatomy. If there is no pulse on uh, palpation dorsal spinitis, then you have to know the anatomy because you want to intervene. Then why not CT angiography directly when there is no pulse on palpation? Well, I mean. You know, you have a point that obviously if there's the, the, the artery is not palpable, you, you know, one can go in for a contrast and job, either CT or MR. But let's not forget that this is a CT gives you, one CT angiogram gives you almost the radiation equivalent to 25 chest x rays So there's a huge amount of radiation that you're exposing your patient to, that's number one. Number two, there's 200 milliliters of contrast which is going to go into the patient. The CT angio, they use 200 ml of contrast every CT angiogram. Which means that all that dye is going to go into your system. If they are a diabetic patient, if they have, uh, you know, um, compromised renal function, maybe, maybe just even if it's marginal uh, renal dysfunction, it can get precipitated. So my advice to you is that if the doctor report says that yes, there is proximal disease, yes, there is extensive disease, then by all means get it done, check the. But before ordering a, a CT angiogram, get your creatinine done. Because if the creatinine is high, then you should not. Just get an MR angio. So, MR angio can be done without contrast in that case? Yes, MR and angio. Because if there is no pulse, in most of the cases you will find pathology, you have to intervene. That's why I am saying why not MR angio or CT angio directly? Sir, uh, if there is no pulse on pulse. Yes. You are absolutely right. But I am telling you, we find it difficult sitting in a hospital. We find it difficult for the patient to come, who comes to us for the first time, who hasn't been to anybody, to tell him that, you know, go and get a CT angio in fact, we sometimes even have patients in which when the patient comes to us and we can't find the pulse, we do a doctor and we say, yes, there is a problem. 
but your creatine is high, so you cannot undergo an angiogram. So what we do is we tell them that look here, whatever treatment is required, we can do it, and we can do what is called a carbon dioxide angiography. You know, when we do angiography, you have to still use the contrast. Again, the risk of dye nephropathy, contrast nephropathy, is there, even when you're doing angiography. Even when you're doing an angiography for ballooning or angioplasty that I showed you, contrast is going to be used, and that is that can cause renal toxicity or um, uh, you know contrast-induced nephropathy. So here we use, we have facility at Medanta of using carbon dioxide gas. We can inject carbon dioxide gas into this and this gives us a negative image of the artery and you can actually do angioplasties under carbon dioxide angiography without any deleterious effect on the kidneys. So on the kidney function. So we do that as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. So, what, what, what is, is there some role of the number center back well, yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. That is a great question. See, uh, Dr. Sir mentioned that there was, we used to see a lot of Burgess disease. We used to say we used to see a lot of Burgess disease. Burgess disease is basically in the young smoker male. That was the definition. Anybody who's more than 50 years of age has atherosclerotic. Now, when we say atherosclerosis, we are talking about a plaque. We are talking about we are talking about calcification. What is happening in Burgess? It is basically a muscular degeneration. There is a spasm. So if you do lumbar sympathectomy, you are releasing that spasm. The artery is dilating and you are getting your blood supply. In an atherosclerotic artery, in a diabetic artery, there is no spasm. It is a plaque. It is calcified. That artery is not going to expand if you do a lumbar sympathectomy. So lumbar sympathectomy in a diabetic foot patient with who has diabetic calcified arteries, the artery is not going to get dilated. So there is no point in doing a lumbar sympathectomy. It has no role whatsoever. I don't remember doing one. Dr. Jitendra Saxena has a question, sir. Sir, uh, sir my question is, you have talked about how you can save the amputation. But there will be occasions when you are required to fix an amputation. Like in an accident that somebody's hand has been chopped off or longer, then of course, again, your services would be required. So my first question is, how much is the maximum time when you can uh, save an amputated leg or foot what is the maximum time? And, so, uh, so, and you, of course, you would be doing uh, arterial to arterial, venous to venous, and estomosis, similarly with the nerves also. So, would you require the services of neurosurgeon along, alongside, you, alongside you to carry out the nerve grafting? Yeah, that's absolutely great. So, this is fortunately in a hospital like ours where we have a multidisciplinary team. We would be having three people. We would have the plastic surgeon, we would have the uh, the neurosurgeons, and we would have the vascular surgeon. All three people working together. The maximum time limit depends on a how is the injury, where did it occur, and how what is the state of the amputated limb or finger or whatever has been amputated. So if the you know if it has been crushed completely and you know it's not going to be able to survive then obviously I mean I don't think it's an exercise that one should take undertake but if the the limb has been actually preserved now the best way to preserve a limb if or a, or a finger or a hand which has been amputated we get a lot of thresher injuries in March February March you know you know the farmers they a thresher's mother I know but I'm talking about you know that, that was what used to get, we used to get and those those used to uh, lead to a straight cut amputation now if you put that am amputated limb, matlab, you know, whatever part is, if you put it in a plastic bag, plastic bag with no water, no ice, nothing, put it in a bag, then take another bag, put some cold water or cold saline or cold um, uh, water around that so that the water doesn't get into the limb, so that it doesn't get macerated because you know, if you put a limb inside water, it's going to get macerated. So it should be outside, it should be cooled but not and within 8 hours, I think that's the golden period, within 6 to 8 hours if the patient comes in with the limb which is well preserved, then 3 people can get together and start doing it. In our case, anything below the elbow is taken over and done by the plastic surgeon and the neurosurgeon, they do it together and they also do with, you know, nerve grafts and everything is fixed at the same time. Yes, but that's that's exactly what it is. Just another question, uh, anything can a vascular surgeon can do for uh, say Raynaud's disease? Well, yeah, Raynaud's disease again, you know, we are coming up with winter and this is something that's going to happen. Primarily medical management, primarily <laughs> medical management and the gold standard here is to recognize that this person is likely candidate for Raynaud's and prevent the occurrence rather than treat 
the the disease when it occurs. Because once the attack has started, that means peripheral vasospasm has occurred. It's going to be very very difficult, and the chances of losing either a tip of a finger or a tip of a toe or whatever is very high. So you start off with these patients because they will always give you history that you know during the winter months if they touch something cold or whatever, their fingers become white and then they become blanched and you know whatever happens. So medical management, of course, you give vasodilators, you give antiplatelets, you can give low molecular weight heparin, you can give fondaparinux, and this is to be given initially and keep the limb warm. Another very important advice to these patients with Raynaud's is no direct heating. Never sit in front of a fire or a heater or whatever. Keep the room warm. The ambient temperature of the room should be warm, but not no any direct no direct heating because if you have any direct heating because of the of the um, uh, you know loss of sensation you can develop burns and you can develop blisters you will lose your limb because of the fact that you have heated so avoid direct heating avoid cold exposure antiplatelets intravenous and then of course we also have intravenous prostaglandins so intravenous prostaglandin infusions can be given which cause a lot of arteriolar uh, uh, dilatation and that can also help. Dr. Bhalla has a question, sir. Sir, you mentioned about uh, uh, glue in varicose veins. Is it biodegradable? No. It is cyanoacrylate glue which surgeons use even for you know skin stitches. So it is a glue which remains, but it's completely inert. It remains where it is. And don't forget, where are we injecting it? We are injecting it inside the vein. It's not going out into the body. It is remaining where it is, and it is only going to cause obliteration of the vein and remain there. It's not going to go away anywhere. But it will remain as a but cord. It's, yeah, it's remaining like a cord in a in a in a very this thing. It's a very small amount. We are using 0.1 ml in 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 you know in one segment. A total of maybe 4 ml in the entire vein. Four, you know, four, four point five ml. That's it. So it's it's a very small amount and it's intraluminal, so it'll never get out into the system. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, I have a uh, few questions. You mentioned uh, about varicose veins and you said the uh, modality of therapy these days is RFA, uh, radio frequency ablation. Uh, how much does it cost for a bilateral varicose veins in the lower limbs in your center? The total cost. Okay, so total cost of bilateral varicose veins would be between about about a lakh, lakh, lakh fifteen, one lakh fifteen thousand. Everything. It's a package deal in a local uh, under local anesthesia in a daycare facility. You come to defense colony, Medanta Med Med Medi Clinic. I'm here twice a week, every Tuesday and Saturday. And you walk in in the morning at ten o'clock after light breakfast, and you walk out with a light lunch at two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's a walk-in, walk-out procedure. It costs you about one lakh ten or one lakh fifteen, I think it it does. And if we were to use glue, that adds to the cost. If we use glue, because the cost of the glue, this is Vena Seal Glue by Medtronic, which is the latest edition in the last two years that we've been starting, we've been using it. That increases the cost by almost about seventy thousand rupees. So it's about one lakh eighty thousand rupees, eighty eighty one thousand rupees for both legs if we use glue. Sir, my, uh, uh, another question is, sometimes we have big hemangiomas in the, in the lower limb, especially in the thigh region. Uh, how do you uh, uh, handle them and what is the cost? Okay, so this is also an you know, excellent question because hemangiomas is a completely different area. Hemangiomas can be very... You, you didn't show us any slides of those. No, I didn't, I didn't. Because, I mean, it was, it was just, you know, we, Doxa was... Yeah, yeah, and you were afraid of him. I, I could understand. You are afraid of him. So, I... I okay. So, yes, that's right. So, so um, you know, the, the... I mean, just briefly, I can tell you, hemangiomas can be of three types. One is an arterial hemangioma, that means only arteries. And the way to diagnose is you put your hand and your hand will start jumping. So it's an arterial, it's a pulsatile hemangioma. So that's that's an arterial hemangioma. If there is, then we have an arteriovenous malformation, which means that there is an artery as well as veins. And here you will find a lot of veins which are dilated. You will find lots and lots of veins on the on the on the arm. Like you see about two of these here on the hand, but instead of these two, you'll find a thousand. You know, there'll be just lots and lots of veins, and the whole place will be swollen. That's number two. Number three is a capillary, a capillary hemangioma, which means it's all in the skin, and you can see very large vessels, and the skin starts to rupture because of the pressure. So you have capillary hemangiomas. So these are three: arterial only, arterial venous, and this thing. Now, if it is an arterial aneurysm, which we know clinically, arterial venous also we know. What we do is we get a CT angiography 
of the area to identify which is the artery which is supplying that nidus, you know where the malformation is. And if it is a distinct artery which is reaching there, what we do is we puncture, the, we go through like a, do an angiography, we take a catheter, we take a catheter and enter that particular, selectively enter that artery and inject glue into it. There's this special lipidol glue and which we can inject and we can completely shrink this thing and this whole thing shrinks down. If it's only a venous hemangioma, then we can inject some, uh, you know, the, the, the cetrol, which is which is basically uh, sodium tetradesyl sulfate, which we also inject varicose veins with. You can inject it directly percutaneously into this and occlude these. So depending on whether it's arterial, venous or arteriovenous, we would decide on the match. Sir, you mentioned also about COVID and we all suffered in the Delta wave when we lost near and dear ones. It was havoc all around. And you also mentioned that almost 100% of people who are admitted for COVID in hospital they uh, essentially received uh, 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 low molecular weight heparin in, in whatever dose uh, uh, that, that you calculated. For our knowledge, sir, many of us used, I am going retrospectively, but very important question for us. We saw a lot of people with very high D-dimer values. And we were using a PEXABEL, 2.5 mg twice a day or 5 mg once a day. What was the correct dose that we should have used and should we have used Epixabel or other uh, inhibitors in all these people without being uh, held accountable in a consumer protection act? I think this is an extremely, extremely important and relevant question. Let me tell you three things. Number one is that, you know, just going off track, which you said that we all suffered. You know, as doctors, we always felt that we were invincible. We problem not We can manage everything. COVID brought all of us down to our knees. All of us down to our knees. Whether you were the head of the department or whatever, you were the chief of whichever hospital or institute, you had no idea what was happening. You didn't know where to go. You did not know what to take. You did not have any treatment options. So it really brought us down to our knees. And this actually tells us that there is something else which is actually there, which is helping and protecting us. So that is something which is a reality, which is something that we must all accept and humbly accept because this is something. So we are not invincible. Something happens. That's number one. Number two is that, yes, any patient who got admitted into the hospital, see, 90% or 95% of the patients who got admitted into the hospital were, did get admitted because of some serious complication. 10% of the people just occupied rooms just because they were scared at home. But 90% of the patients got admitted because of a problem. Those patients, if they were severe enough, they all were put on low molecular weight heparin, but this was only in the last year. First episode, which is the which is the Delta wave, the first one in, in 2019. No, 2020. 2020, 2020. March 2020. 2020, nobody had a clue. 2020, nobody had a clue. All we were doing was in, uh, ventilating everybody and we were killing patients by ventilating them. But basically what was required was just anticoagulation, which we got to know after the Danes in Denmark, they started doing autopsies on these patients who were killed. And they realized that this was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, thromboinflammation and pulmonary embolism which was killing these patients. They stopped ventilating and they started putting patients on low molecular weight heparin and that's when the whole treatment scenario changed. So anyway, so this is what was had. So whenever these patients came to us, we were giving them low molecular weight heparin or fontaparinox we were giving them. They were, while they were at the hospital, while they were recovering, they were all on low molecular weight heparin. Now, Coming to discharge, when these patients are being discharged, that is the time for extended prophylaxis. So, if they have had moderate or severe COVID uh, syndrome for uh, you know for 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 uh, well, I mean as a reason for admission, these patients would be given at least four to six weeks, four to six weeks of anticoagulation at home. This would have obviously have to be oral because nobody is going to be really injecting himself orally. You were absolutely right, a Pixaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day was probably the right dose and this is something which is practiced even today. 5 milligrams once a day can be done but it has been shown that the bioavailability is very, very, uh, you know, it's intermittent. That means when you take 5 milligrams, the level goes that high and then it goes down again. So if you take 2.5 twice a day, then the level or the bioavailability of the drug in the blood is almost stable. So 2.5 milligrams twice a day. You could also use rivaroxaban 2.5 twice a day. You could also use 110 or 150 milligrams of dabigatron. So you could use either across the board. 
warfarin was not used in, in, in these cases because INR would be completely wavered and you will not be able to stabilize it because there were so many other drugs which would be taken and as you know warfarin interacts with a lot of drugs. So these three drugs, apixaban and for some I mean, uh, uh, ease because apixaban has two very important characteristics. Number one, most importantly, is that it is safe in patients with renal disease. Okay? It does not because it has a liver excretion, it has had a hepatic excretion, which is why if it is if your kidneys are damaged, it doesn't matter. So you can actually use a fixaban, which is the reason why that got, got into prominence and will be used. Sir, what were you targeting at that time? Suppose we were giving a fixaban. So what were you targeting? Were you targeting D dimer or you were tar targeting clinical improvement? Okay. So no. Clinical improvement was was being done and monitored with whatever you were doing. This was not for that. D dimer levels were going up, which were telling us that there is a huge amount of I mean, thromboinflammation going on in the body. And so you were basically trying to use this to monitor and get your D dimer levels down. So it wasn't clinical because there was nothing happening to these patients. It was just if they deteriorated, they would land up in the ICU on a ventilator. But if they didn't, you just carried them on on on. Sir, over to the masters, Dr. Tulsi sir. First, let me thank Dr. Balabhi, doctor. And an excellent question. So now I request Dr. Tulsi, he is a master of the surgery. And we are here to Dr. Tulsi and Dr. Gavra. Hello, Dr. Gavra. Sir, I'm very sorry about that. You are on the fire now, sir. Hello. Sorry, sorry for what, sir? Sir, you are on the fire. I'm on the fire. So, before Dr. Chauhan says, darling, it's uh, time to wind up. I have some comments and maybe some questions if you can say that. After the wonderful questions from our colleagues here. Studies have, uh, Dr. Ajipalik, studies have uh, suggested that even asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease is associated with increased AD mortality and erectile dysfunction, as uh, Dr. Raina, our sexologist, would say has been linked as a potential indicator for both CAT and PVD. So, uh, our colleagues talked about uh, CTA and MRA, Dr. Podar and LMP. I believe probably MRA is the modality of choice for imaging because CTA, you know, causes a lot of, uh, you know, exposure to radiation, not only that, you need a very high dose, see as you rightly said, for a CTA, but probably MRA would be the uh, modality of imaging. Having said that, probably angiography is uh, the gold standard, especially, in, you know, if you have to intervene, okay, either by either uh, endovascular procedure or a bypass surgery. So, uh, Dr. Ajit, tell us, uh, Dr. Uh, John, I'd like to have you there. <laughs> Because we are now going to talk about drugs, see, after that gold standard uh, statins, see, there are drugs which have to be given, like SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. Give a chair. So, Dr. Chuan, what do you say? SGLT2 inhibitors and uh, GLP-1 agonists, probably, are the drugs to be given here. Let me complete, sir. Speaker is Dr. Rajiv Yeah, but uh, probably uh, he's a surgeon. See, he would be more accomplished to talk about that. And of course, uh, Dr. Mansur as well. So, uh, uh, so after that Canvas trial, which had increased uh, lower limb amputations, see, the uh, American Limb Preservation Society took a closer look. See? in these uh, invitations and they said they studied patients for a long time and they published this in the European Heart Journal 2,72,000 patients study, and they said HGLT2 inhibitors no other risks no evidence you see in fact they probably better you see peripheral vascular disease but not to be given then if you have CLI uh, they said liraglutide and simaglutide, you see, said between 16 to 30 percent people had regression of PAD. Dr. John, your word. So, uh, coming to your question of uh, canvas trial and uh, chances of uh, amputations being, you know, almost uh, 
one and a half times in the trial period. But when they came to the real world evidence, sir, you would know the follow-up studies all across Canada and US. They were, uh, they found out that there was no absolute increase in the rate of amputations in the real world evidence on on use of caraglifosin. Actually, this trial, when it was uh, put to further usage, they only said that it was because of the patient selection that was causing this. Absolutely. And what was the patient selection, Dr. Mathur? It said they were probably had, you know, diabetes for long duration. These were elderly patients. They had CKD. They had prior uh, CAD, even CAD. So, Dr. Chua, go ahead. So, so, so SCLT2 inhibitors, now over, I think we have had a very extensive experience with SCLT2 inhibitors. I myself have presented, I think, at least, uh, I would say, 20 CMEs on SCLT2 inhibitors in this esteemed forum. And whether it was MPRI trial or it was a trial with the uh, uh, with dapagliflozin or it was trial even with uh, uh, canagliflozin, uh, they have been found to be very safe. Only thing is that when you come to the end point, then we have to choose which one you are looking at. But as far as peripheral arterial disease is concerned or amputations is concerned, on that score, there is no problem with any, any of the SCLG inhibitors. Yeah, sure, sir. Dr. Tiyashiro, actually, the patient of mine was a diabetic for 20 years, coronary artery disease. <laughs> And he has a peripheral vascular disease. He has undergone, he has been on SCLT2 inhibitor for the last 15 years, 10 years maybe, I don't know. But he has gone under amputation four times, all the four doses have been removed at Gangaram Asun, sir. He has a peripheral vascular disease, atherosclerosis, all over the place, both sides. They have done deprivement, they have done amputation, his wound is not healed as late. He has been suffering like that. They get all kinds of medication. He is bedridden right now because of the peripheral vascular disease. And I think the so Dr. Macho, if you have a CLI, yeah. you see, you cannot give these drugs. But it is being treated by Gangarab and the experts in the field. They were giving it. No, sir. SGLT2 inhibitors are was contraindicated in CLI. That was true, sir. But it was treated as a diabetes. It is being controlled very well with SGLT2 inhibitors. It was doing well. No, my okay. sir. But if you have a CLI, yeah. you cannot give a GLT2 inhibitors. I know that that was the one part that was given to him, but it didn't help him at all. One part of the research with you. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, a little word on testosterone. See, therapy or uh, known as testosterone replacement therapy. It's the Travers trial, which is due end of this year. A five-year trial, large trial. They looked into uh, testosterone therapy, improving vascular health. And these patients were patients who were really who had CKD, who had prior, you know, cardiovascular events as well. So these were very high-risk patients. And this trial is going to talk no, no, no. The US FDA and the ACC and the AHA. Are absolutely sure, and they said testosterone increased CV events, they increased uh, you know, MI, they increased strokes. But the European Heart Society said there is not enough evidence to suggest that this is true. So, probably the Trevor's trial is going to come and uh, to shed some light on that. What do you say, sir? I mean, I, I would leave it to, to the more intelligent people. <laughs> I am not, like, 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 not, as, as surgeons, I think we have limited mental ability. But we, yes, we, we, do believe, we do believe that medical management is extremely important and there is definitely a role for a lot of these medical, new medical therapies which are there. And there is a trial that we have which is called the COMPASS trial in which a low dose given along with aspirin, 75 milligrams once a day, a combination of Eproximal plus Eproximal uh, plus Ecostrin. This reduces the adverse thing events including amputations in patients with CA. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kolda, sir, uh, some, uh, sir. some, some uh, directed questions to Dr. Raju Parikh, sir. Very, very, very and, smart. And, and please do not involve me. Tulsi sir. Sir, I was, I was so much delighted to know Dr. Uh, Parikh started that diabetes is a malignancy of vascular system. It's so, so rightly said, sir. Microvascular or microvascular, whatever, they come hand in hand. And uh, the number of uh, 
see me we have done 808 i would say nothing between two fat ladies and uh, after 80 such episodes i will be uh, presiding over and say three fat ladies and just like three blind mice there was a uh, novel uh, i will i am reminded sir the vascular age was one of the uh, uh, fancy these days we say vascular age and your biological age so uh, how much you uh, weigh that how much you say uh, can we know our vascular age and our biological we know yeah see biological age is of course as you know yeah. what is what is given to you by your parents but only yeah. as they as you know and whenever you born as far as vascular age is concerned as i said whenever atherosclerotic plaques are picked up that is something that you should see if it is an isolated area in one single artery you can say that that is at least 25% of your life is over okay and then of course as you go on and there is dissemination there is increase there is uh, you know wide progression then of course your age increases but i don't think you can put a number to saying that you know this is going to be 10 years or 20 years or 30 years but yes the age increases and but the most important thing is that if the there is rapid progression between two ultrasound scans of 6 months apart then you can be sure that your life span is reducing definitely and lifestyle modification and medical management is extremely important. and sir take home message is that those who are smoking they should stop smoking those who are diabetic they should control it meticulously then they can reverse it whatever was bad it is reversed it's reversible and uh, you can gain whatever uh, it was due to you so veins and artery they have different problems arteries have a problem of atherosclerosis more and veins have thrombosis more so we have to deal with them separately and the four arteries as you said to usme main thoda sa janna chahta hu ki kya periphery se shuru hoti hai kahani ya central se shuru hoti hai nahi ye maine kahin padha tha this is not something that is written anywhere but this was something that i read that you know the four compartments or four periods of one's life may be divided by or can be supposedly divided by the presence of atherosclerosis because the the terminal event is thrombosis right so that is the reason why this simply has been given but it's not but it's not sacrosanct it's not written but for me mai abhi tak aapko mere jo very close vein wale patient hai mai unke liye refer karta raha hu कि जाइए बास्को सर्जन से मिलो बाकी सबको मैं सुनता था कि मैं ही चीज कर लूंगा सो आई मे बी रॉन्ग सर तो आपने वो जो सब इंटीमल अप्रोच की जो बात करी थी इससे डबल एज वेपन जी सो वन मे बी हार्मिंग एट टाइम्स बट यू नो यू हैव टू बी एक्सट्रीमली केयरफुल विद एक्सपीरियंस एंड विद एक्सपर्टीज वी कैन एक्चुअली मैनेज टू डू इट फेली सेफली वी हैव फॉर द लास्ट ऑलमोस्ट यू नो वी बी डूइंग इट मोर देन 25 इयर्स नाउ एंड I mean, I keep my fingers crossed. We've had no disastrous complications. Yeah, my, last, we won't be able to my last comment is on epixaban. So it was five milligrams once daily for prevention and twice daily for treatment. Your comment? Yeah. So five milligrams was for prevention if you were trying to prevent over the long period of time. But even then, 2.5 milligrams twice a day was considered to be a better dose than five milligrams once a day because of the biological. when you are treating this disease it is 10 mg twice a day for 7 days followed by 5 mg twice a day there are so nice sir so you clear my doubt and uh, dr manish uh, dr manish paliwal you have a question sir kindly ask him you very that honda pen is much more uh, has a longer half life but more expensive So most of us are using in prophylaxis, let's say, or uh, in oxygen. Mm -hmm. So what would be your views? I think the university said that you know forty uh, units subcutaneous is adequate. So how would you uh, feel and what would you be your expert about? Okay. So the so the prophylactic dose is two point five milligrams. Yeah, quite enough. Which I think is not more expensive. Which I don't think is more expensive than using 40 milligrams of uh, uh, 
40 milligrams of uh, inoxaparin. So the dose is the same. And uh, you see, there is what we are seeing now is that there is a fairly significant, not a very large number, but a significant number of people who develop thrombocytopenia. That means their platelet counts drop. And in such a situation, heparin and heparin products, which is low molecular weight heparin, is contraindicated. Fonda Paranox is the only, uh, 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 you know, direct factor 10 inhibitor which can be used, which does not reduce the platelet count. So, in such situations when there is, that is probably, uh, you know, the drug of choice. So, otherwise, we can use them, you know, uh, either we use Fonda or we use Anoxaparin. Yeah, they can be used, but obviously... Yeah, you can use them prophylactically, but I mean, you can't switch them every day. Yeah. Yeah. If you are on Monday Paranex, then you continue with that. If you are on Noxaparin, then you continue on that. 40 milligrams once. Uh, I think I think uh, it's time to wind up the CME. I would give the mic to Dr. S.K. Mathur to summarize it for us. To summarize the uh, CME for us. Once again, good evening. It was a wonderful talk by Dr. Paran. It really enlightened us about the vascular health, which is a very important parameter to improve our lifespan or longevity of life. Also, with the longevity, the quality of life is also very important. If you are compromising the quality of life, the longevity is not very important. I would say quality is important along with the vascular health. So we should look after our quality and longevity both. And vascular health is very important, which is very well highlighted by Dr. Pari. We are very thankful to you, sir, for giving us this and talk and enlightening us about the whole thing. Thank you so much. Very nice of you, sir. Uh, friends, uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would just request you uh, uh, to please join us for dinner now. And I think you would all agree that it was a wonderful talk on uh, vascular health. If he doesn't stop smoking, it is as good as committing suicide. If he is a diabetic, if he doesn't keep his HPA1C near 7, whatever else you do doesn't make a difference. Number three, if there is a strong family history of cardiovascular diseases, this person must get out of his bed and out of his home and go for a walk at least five days out of seven days and walk or do any sort of good uh, exercise at least for 30 minutes, 150 minutes in a week. Number four, if there is documented history of dyslipidemia, he must control his lipids either with drugs or as sir said, even with Baba Ramdev's remedy, whatever, but he must get his lipid goals to target.